What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman. We're back again with some more Napoleon. Uh, Napoleons of Vietnam. We just finished that one. Uh, and now this one's called Wellington Strikes. Uh, which, I mean, which I believe means Wellington Strikes Napoleon. Because, you know, so something's at Wellington's sleeve. And apparently, you know. But, like, I guess it wouldn't be Strikes Napoleon. Right now, isn't Napoleon is, like, I don't know. He's up like on vacation up north somewhere uh, with his wife or his mistress or something or other. Uh, not on vacation, but like he's not exactly, you know, in the war right now that's going on in, uh, you know, Spain. So it'd be interesting to see what goes on here because it could be, you know, since Napoleon's gone, Wellington takes advantage of the situation and really takes a hold of Spain. I don't know. Or maybe Napoleon comes down and then. You know, and Wellington kind of like catches them by surprise, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not sure. Uh, I just I just wanted to say though, uh, I'm jealous of you guys in Europe and Asia when it comes to history. Uh, when I when I grow up, you know, went to school and went to high school, all we had was Canadian history, and that there was an option to learn American history, and I took that option in high school because you know history is fun and stuff. And even though, like, Canadian and American history is, you know, cool and fun and all, and, you know, I love my country, uh, we have nothing when it comes to history and you guys in Europe and stuff. Like, that must have been, like, so cool to, you know, learn all this in school. Like, if, that, if they had, like, a class for this in school, I totally would have took it in high school. I just think it's it's just fun. And obviously, it's, it's school, so, you know, assignments, all that stuff would suck. But, you know, in general, you know, it would be, be kind of fun to learn this stuff. But, uh Anyways, on to, on to the task at hand. And before I do, I just want to let you guys know, you guys should definitely check out Epic, Epic History uh, TV. They ha have amazing videos. I've been going along a bunch of their videos, and they're just amazing. So props to them. And, uh, yeah, we're going to continue on our Napoleon journey. I know some of you probably haven't watched these before and are watching them along with me for the first time. That's awesome. I know some of you have already watched this and are, you know, watching along with me and enjoying the ride with me and seeing my excitement for it so either way that's awesome thank you guys for watching and i know you guys are like just get off the damn video <laughs> all right spain 1812 hit that like and subscribe button please if you don't mind thank you very much it would help me out a lot now to the video by 1812, Napoleon's French Empire had a quarter of a million troops stationed in Spain, bogged down in a war that seemed to have no end. They faced a bitter struggle against the people of Spain, who'd taken up arms in a guerrilla war, as well as the remnants of Spain's field armies and an Anglo-Portuguese army under Lord Wellington. But French forces in Spain remained formidable and in firm control of the capital, Madrid, and most major cities. And the year began with another great French victory in the south, and a calamity for Spain. Uh -oh. This video is sponsored by Audible, our favorite place to go for audiobooks. They have an unmatched selection of fiction, comedy, classics, and original content, all of which you can listen because it's audible, you can brush up on evolutionary history while this video. Huh. Spain and Portugal would become a graveyard, not just for young French conscripts, but for the reputation of some of France's most famous generals. General Junot, Marshal Soult and Marshal Jourdain had all tasted defeat. Marshal Massena had been recalled in disgrace. Yeah. Marshal Louis Gabriel Suchet was the exception. French generals in Spain were notorious for their looting. Soult, based in Andalusia, was probably the worst, reckoned to have stolen one and a half million francs worth of art from Spanish monasteries and churches. Wow. As governor of Aragon, Marshal Suchet behaved very differently. He enforced strict discipline on his troops, 
punishing any who tried to steal or extort money from the Spanish, while treating local authorities with respect. Well. He combined this hearts and minds strategy with ruthless military action against the guerrillas that was able to establish firm control of Aragon. It looks like you, like you you earn respect, you know, you respect other people's belongings and stuff, and you get respect back in return. And like a guy who like what, who was it who brought his mistress with him, and then of course has got no respect, and then you know obviously look, you know, Napoleon, you know, looks down on that and just makes everyone look bad. And like, how do you how are your troops gonna fight for you when you can't even I don't know when respect's not involved? Anyways. Back to able to establish firm control of Aragon. In June 1811, after a particularly bloody assault, Suchet took the port of Tarragona, for which Napoleon rewarded him with his marshal's baton. The emperor then sent him reinforcements and ordered him to take Valencia. First, he routed a much larger Spanish army that attacked him at Saguntum, before he laid siege to Valencia. The city was packed with Spanish troops and refugees, and to avoid starvation, General Blake surrendered Valencia on the 8th of January, 1812. The French took 18,000 prisoners, including 23 generals, and nearly 500 guns. It was a devastating blow to the Spanish cause. But to reinforce Suchet, Napoleon had stripped troops from other armies in Spain, and then withdrawn 25,000 of the best troops for his imminent invasion of Russia. The result was that French forces in Spain were now severely overstretched, just as Wellington prepared to strike. Oh. So, so we're going to build up to a Wellington, was it Suchet, you know, kind of battle. That's how it looks like it's, you know, it's, you know, the pawns and all that are kind of aligning right here. So this is getting interesting. Spanish guerrillas kept Wellington well informed of French movements. And learning that the forces facing him in western Spain had been much weakened, he decided to go on the offensive, to strike a blow before the French could concentrate against him. On the day that Valencia fell, he laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo on the Portuguese-Spanish frontier. Eager to take the city before Marshal Marmont could march to its relief, he ordered an assault after just 10 days. It succeeded, though Major General Crawford of the Light Division was among 300 killed. Wellington then marched south to besiege the much more strongly defended city of Badajoz. An assault was made on the night of the 6th of April. The first wave attacking the main breach were slaughtered. But what was supposed to be a diversionary attack on the city's castle with scaling ladders succeeded, and the city soon fell. Wow. The storming of Badajoz cost the British 3,700 casualties. In the aftermath, survivors went on the rampage, drinking, looting, and raping and killing more than 100 Spanish civilians before British officers finally restored order. Damn. Wellington had secured the two main routes between Spain and Portugal. Now he sent his most reliable subordinate, General Hill, with a small Anglo-Portuguese force to destroy the bridge over the Tagus at Almarath. This was a vital link between Marmont's army of Portugal and Soult's Army of the South, as the next usable bridge was at Toledo, 90 miles east. The bridge was well guarded by forts and redoubts, 
but Hill led a swift and daring assault. The French defences were taken by surprise. The bridge itself and all the engineering equipment burned, for the cost of just 177 casualties. Not bad. Wellington was now ready to begin his advance into Spain. Spanish regular forces and guerrilla bands began operations to tie down as many French troops as possible. While from the Bay of Biscay, Sir Hume Popham's naval raiding force made diversionary attacks on French coastal targets. In four days, Wellington was at Salamanca, as Marmont, outnumbered, withdrew behind the Douro River. But when reinforcements arrived, he crossed the river again. Uh -oh. For six days, Marmont tried to march around Wellington's flank, but the British general matched him move for move, their two armies marching in parallel, often within sight of each other. That'd be crazy. But on the seventh day, Marmont blundered. Oh, we do. On the morning of the 22nd of July, Wellington's army occupied high ground four miles south of Salamanca. Marmont was not interested in a direct assault. He still sought to outflank Wellington, threaten his line of retreat to Portugal, and force him to fall back. All right. Around 8 a.m., the French won a dash for a hill known as the Greater Arapil, which Marmont made his observation point. The French army began to swing round behind him. Marmont had convinced himself that Wellington was an overly cautious general who would not risk attack. The hills hid most of Wellington's army from view. And when Marmont saw dust clouds to the west, he assumed it was Wellington's baggage train leaving Salamanca, beginning their retreat. But it was the British 3rd Division and a Portuguese cavalry brigade moving up to strengthen Wellington's flank. Because he wasn't planning a retreat, he was about to attack. Dang. We just like that. I mean, that is smart, you know. You're, you basically you're looked upon as being a cautious person. So what do you do? You know, oh, this person thinks I'm cautious, huh? Well, you know, I'll I'll just get some troops, and, you know, to sneak up on his butt. You know, it's or you know to cut him off or or whatever. You know, just you use your image, you know, as a you know, um, whatever to succeed. I don't I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but you know, you definitely use his image for uh, whatever in this, you know. Sorry. Wow. Around 2 p.m., Marmont ordered the five infantry divisions waiting in the woods behind him to march west to cut off Wellington's imagined retreat. Imagine retreat. General Mokun's 5th Division, in the lead, stopped to engage what was presumed to be the British rearguard in the village of Los Arapiles. General Tomier's 7th Division continued west past it. Wellington watched as the French left flank became increasingly strung out and knew it was an opportunity too good to miss. He galloped three miles across country to the 3rd Division to give the crucial orders in person. Many of his staff officers struggled to keep up. That's awesome. On arrival, he instructed the division's commander, his own brother-in-law, Edward Pakenham, to attack and drive everything before him. These guys are in person. Third, Third division's advance was hidden by low hills until the last minute. Tomier's division was caught completely unawares and shattered by the assault. Tomier's himself was killed, half his division killed or captured, 
the rest soon put to flight. At this crucial moment, Marshal Marmont was hit by a British shell and carried from the field seriously wounded. His second in command, General Bonnet, was himself wounded an hour later. So command passed to General Clausel. 45 minutes later, the British 5th Division attacked, supported by two Portuguese brigades and General Le Marchand's dragoons. The French saw the cavalry coming and formed square, but were hit first by the British infantry, who unleashed a close-range volley, then charged with the bayonet. Look at that, man. The French were routed and charged down by Le Marchand's cavalry. French 6th Division was caught up in the collapse. Le Marchand himself was shot from the saddle, but his brigade had helped destroy eight French battalions and capture two eagles. Wow. Wellington's echelon attack continued as Cole's 4th Division advanced. In I don't know, but like once they got caught, you know, by surprise over here, and then the two generals, you know, basically got killed, you know, and had to leave, and you're, you're down to like your third tier general. I mean, you think it like, hey, man, this this might not be your day. Let's just back retreat and live to see another day, and then we'll come back at them. I don't know, stronger the next day. I don't know. That's just me. I'm gonna. That's uh, probably obviously why I'm not a general or wouldn't be one because that's just my thinking anyway. Uh, but dang, Wellington. Kicking butt. Wellington's echelon attack continued as Cole's 4th Division advanced in the centre. But Pack's Portuguese brigade was thrown back from the Greater Arapil, and the whole division was soon falling back in disorder. Okay, well, yeah. I was wrong. Despite the devastation of his army's left flank, General Clausel decided to launch an attack on the Lesser Arapil, the hinge of Wellington's position. If it could be taken, he might still snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But the French advance was met by fresh... Well, it looks like, the, anyways, you know, the British are going to take them. But I, I was definitely wrong because they, they pushed them back and everything, you know. They're the ones who know the tactics and the train and know what they're doing, not me. So <laughs> I admit I was wrong. <laughs> The French advance was met by fresh troops of Clinton's 6th Division, who poured volleys of musket fire into the French columns. They began to fall back. The French army had lost the will to fight on, its soldiers streaming away into the woods behind them. I guess they had to retreat anyway, General right? Ferre's 3rd Division mounted a brave rearguard action to buy the rest of the army time to escape, but it faced a hopeless task. It was soon outflanked by the British 5th Division, and Ferre himself was killed. Only General Foy's 1st Division escaped in good order. With darkness falling and his army exhausted, Wellington called off the pursuit. Maybe I was right, huh? It was cool. They, they tried, though, like, from their last effort, they pushed them back, and, you know, it was just, I guess, you know, Wellington had to have the higher train, the advantage, you know, it was just too much for him. Wellington had smashed Marmont's army, taking 7,000 prisoners, killing or wounding 6,000 more, a French casualty rate of 25%, and more than double Wellington's own losses. The next day, dragoons of the King's German Legion attacked the French rearguard and achieved the almost unheard of feat of charging down a French infantry square and taking another 1,000 prisoners. Wow. Wellington now decided to march on Madrid, forcing King Joseph to abandon the capital and retreat to Valencia to join up with Marshal Suchet. 
On the 12th of August, Wellington liberated the city to scenes of wild celebration. Soult, now at risk of being cut off in Andalusia, abandoned the siege of Cadiz, which had dragged on for two and a half years, and marched east to join Joseph and Suchet. Long siege. The following month, Wellington marched north, pushing the French back from Valladolid and besieging the castle of Burgos. But his army lacked heavy guns, and the French garrison fought bravely. As powerful French armies gathered to the north and south, Wellington himself was now in danger of being trapped. He had no choice but to withdraw. Wellington's retreat turned into a desperate forced march through autumn rain. The supply system collapsed, and many starving soldiers looted what food they could find from Spanish villages. Madrid was abandoned and reoccupied by the French on the 1st of November. Wellington was back where he'd started five months before. Wow. But despite the campaign's dismal conclusion, his strike into Spain had led to the liberation of huge swathes of the country yeah, right down and there. left the French more overstretched than ever. Reinforced and resupplied, Wellington would be back the next year to deliver the final blow to Joseph's Spanish kingdom. 1812 had seen the tide of war turn, and not just in Spain, because 2,000 miles to the east, in Russia, catastrophe had engulfed the Grande Armée. Catastrophe. Oh my god. Oh my Thank god. Thank you to all our patriots. We're going to Russia, right? Next episode, we're going to Russia. That was playing out here. Uh, invasion of Russia. Don't do it. Don't do it. Ah, it just has disaster written all over it. Ah, there's just too much land, and like your your army's already stretched thin in Spain, you know, and Russia. It just it's a lot bigger. Like you're gonna be stretched even farther, and and like yeah, but Spain and you're in Russia, like you're too far away, and then I don't know the two fronts. It's just uh but anyways, but this you know. So Wellington, you know, that, that was a great battle, you know, he had the advantage and, you know, and he got him. He just, he got him. And then within that, you know, the, the South, you know, they got liberated. And, you know, he, he said he, he basically, you know, back where he came from, but the South got liberated and he's been, and Napoleon's army is still bogged down in Spain when Napoleon needs him even more than ever now, like in Russia. Uh, obviously, next episode. So, but another great episode, and I thought Suchet was gonna be. I thought there was gonna be like a one-on-one -on -one battle with like the two top dogs, but I guess it, didn't, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, but anyways, another awesome episode. Definitely looking forward to the Russia one. Dis you know, disaster. I mean, well, Napoleon, he um, uh, you know, he doesn't. He's already had his one like victorious last victorious campaign. But he's obviously it's Napoleon. He's gonna have some victories. So will we witness, you know, a couple? He's invading Russia. Some some crazy Napoleon victories coming up, or are we looking at a little bit more defeat? Uh, we'll find out, right? We'll find out. Uh, very exciting stuff. Loving this series, and yeah, and we'll just continue along with you guys. I'm having a lot of fun. Hope you guys are having a lot of fun. Definitely a lot of exciting stuff going on with. Uh, Epic History TV, they definitely have a great way of, uh, you know, getting you with the music and the setup. They just do an excellent job. And, but yeah, anyways, please hit that like and subscribe button, guys. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And I'll catch you guys in the next episode. This is, this is exciting stuff, fun stuff. And yeah, peace.